We've been talking a lot about change. Absolutely, things are changing. Customers are more informed, more empowered, more knowledgeable, more vocal. Employees in the next generation are much more technically literate than we are and are no longer willing to accept doing mindless work that was designed by others. They want to be part of creating their own work and creating their own working together environment with others in organize, organizations. And we're on the threshold, I think, of really exploring the full implications of the materials and the communications technologies. And we still don't know quite what those outcomes are going to be. So we're in a time of exploration and a time where we could waste a tremendous amount of money on the wrong choices. So it's a time also where the environment is becoming a much, much more visible consequence of our actions. And so I would argue that in such a time, we can no longer forget people. Focusing on technology and exploiting those technical opportunities is absolutely right. But ignoring people is a big mistake because it's people that manage and cope with and respond to change. So ultimately, lean is a pointer is a direction, is a signal, is an inspiration to a people-centric way of organizing that I believe is the organizational framework we need for the future, for this time of rapid change. So the real promise of Lean, it's still to be realized, we still have to work on it, it's not fixed because it's a, it's a way of thinking and it's a set of ideas and ways of looking at the world that translate into very different actions that have very different consequences. So actually, Lean is a people-centric management system for our time and for the future. Sure, it has a history. Sure, we can look back and see why our misconceptions of Lean early on were often wrong. But now I think we can begin to see the deeper, under, the, the deeper thought process that underlines Lean, and it's about people-centric management systems that are focused on solving user needs, that are focused and built about creating meaningful work for all of our employees, not just a few. And it's one in which in a time of experimentation and the danger of spending too much money on the wrong things, it's a time when we can also save a tremendous amount of time, of capital and resources, and therefore minimize our impact on the environment. And at its core, Lean is a learning system, as we've heard. And it builds a capability throughout the entire organization of learning faster than our competitors. So Lean is actually builds the infrastructure, the mental models, the ways of working together that create the conditions for continuous innovation rather than spectacular, a few spectacular big leaps. So that continuous innovation, I think, is the actual consequence of a different way of thinking. But our challenge, our real challenge, it is, if, is if we continue to see lean, or what people describe as lean, through traditional management thinking, and simply adopt tools of lean and try and implement them, with the traditional thinking, we, will, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't just get traditional results. 
Only if the thinking changes will those tools, those techniques, those perspectives generate the results that Lean promises. So after working with a group of CEOs who went through many Lean programs of their own and ultimately came to the conclusion they had to lean, lean, lead their own Lean transformations actively, personally, we gradually be able to distill what it takes to actually lead Lean. And that has been the missing element in our understanding of, deep understanding of Lean. And we discover that Lean is actually a strategy. Lean is a strategy of building dynamic gains from finding and solving the right problems. It's not about buying best practice and optimizing it. It's about engaging everybody in continuous improvement, continuous accelerating improvements, focused on solving the right problems. That's essentially what real strategy is about. And we discovered, too, that leading a lean, people-centric organization is all about learning. And I think we've all come to that conclusion ourselves. But the missing piece also was, well, how do you translate learning into bottom-line results? If learning is simply nice to have, fun to do, it's not going to convince the finance directors or the boards of directors or your shareholders we can translate learning onto the bottom line. So that's our challenge. And these are the obstacles to that way of thinking that we need to create in the future. We need to learn our way into, uh, think our way into a new way of acting. So what's the problem? And you might reflect on whether you see these characteristics in your organization. First of all, as we're taught in business schools by Michael Porter and others, strategy is what the board and the CEO need to think about. And it's all about positioning in marketplaces, choices of the right technologies, how you compete against competitors. And that's completely separate. If you watch Michael Porter's videos, it's completely separate from execution. Execution is all about just buying best practice, finding the right smart people, the right locations, the lowest cost solutions, and it's all about just buying that best practice. And it's not the job of CEOs and the board and leaders. So that's interesting. You just buy best practice and you force it in. And so what happens, of course, is that managers have been, leaders have been taught it is not their job to be actively engaged in the execution, in operations, in delivery, in, in making products. That's best practice that they commission others to implement for them. So the consequence is that leaders have been taught it's not their job to be actively leading change at the front line, whether it's the design office or whether it's the customer interface or whether it's the production uh, or service delivery point. So not surprisingly, leaders have not been involved. They have been traditionally used to asking outside or internal experts to solve their problems for them. That's what they've been taught to do. Surprise, surprise, Lean takes a very different view. Second, we discover that actually traditional accounting measure, the accounting systems that we use to make decisions actually can't see the problems that are facing the processes and the front line every day. And can't see the problems, but also can't track the improvements to solve those problems. They are invisible in the accounting system. So we have to fundamentally change the way we think about constructing the metrics that define the gaps, that track the physical changes that will close those gaps. 
that will lead to bottom line results. So we fundamentally have to rethink the metrics by which we make decisions. And we've been used to processes and systems designed by experts. And that is how we think about the world. Leaders commission experts to solve their problems. And design processes, better processes, and line management and middle management's job is essentially making sure that those people-free processes, their design so anybody can basically operate them, are complied with. So that's a kind of policeman role. And that's the source of great deal of frustration, but also means the focus is on static optimization with no learning. That is no longer acceptable to the workforce of the future, quite apart from the fact that it, it, it actually kills and stifles learning, which is what we want. Silos and rule-based bureaucracies. I've said many times, and I've been unpopular in saying this, but most of the waste, the expensive waste in organizations is not at the front line. It's at headquarters. It's bright people fighting PowerPoint wars over departmental and silo budgets. You may not have that in your organization, but I suspect that you do. And the truth is that bureaucracy was a tremendous innovation, no question, a German innovation, largely. But actually, it is so powerful in restricting and in con and resisting change that we need to find, and we're never going to get rid of it, but we need to find countermeasures to counter the inherent resistance of silos and bureaucracies to change. The consequence of not being able to see what's really going on in the organization, because the numbers don't tell you, a leadership that is disengaged and silos fighting for budgets is that every management team has long lists. I've seen them everywhere, 60 to 80 projects on their, on their to-do lists. And that simply tells me that they, cannot s they don't have the confidence that any of those projects are necessarily going to succeed. And so therefore, launching a lot of projects, some of them might succeed, hopefully. But we don't know which ones, and we don't know when. So a lean organization is much better able to see the fundamental problems, define the improvement directions, and to focus efforts on closing the gaps. But the deepest source of problems with traditional thinking is top-down, is traditional top-down decision-making. Very interesting. Traditional top-down decision-making is the core of the way we look at the world. And all of those things I've enumerated are consequences of that top-down decision-making. So we need to challenge all of these, including the way we make decisions. So let's start there. Top-down decision-making, you all do it, we all do it, is either the opinion of the most highly paid person in the room, or it's the result of um, things they've heard at conferences, detailed analysis of data, of past data, and so on, that creates a vision for where the organization needs to go. So it's about defining what it is the organization needs to do and then constructing a plan. And then constructing a plan of action in detail with targets and rollout and all the rest of it. And then it's given over to those to execute in the organization, to drive it through the organization 
and then somehow to deal with the consequences. And there are always many consequences. Because as military strategists tell you, no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Events are always different. Planning is everything. Plans are worthless, as Eisenhower said many, many years ago. So however much we plan, we don't know how reality is going to turn out. And we don't know really what the consequences are going to be. So it's actually a bankrupt and fundamentally flawed decision-making process. It's called jumping to solutions. It's fast thinking, if you've understood that and followed Kahneman's slow and th fast thinking, it's jumping to solutions with really minimal evidence of what's really going on because the bureaucracy hides the evidence because it doesn't want to be blamed. So it's fundamentally flawed and it's inherently wasteful. And it's very interesting that in the military, the experience time and time again has been, as Eisenhower said, plans are everything, but planning is worthless. So, sorry, plans, planning is everything, but plans are worthless. And so there is a movement in the military strategists' field, a lot of different experiments going on to actually lead from the ground up, as they call it developing the front line and building the capabilities on the front line to deal with whatever circumstances they find at the time quickly without having to go right back up the organization and develop a plan to do the right thing at the right time. So it's about empowering, it's upskilling the front line and they call it lead leading from the ground up. That sounds a more promising way of thinking. And indeed, that is very much what lean thinking is all about. Lean thinking starts not in the office. Lean thinking starts at the front line. I'll go into it in deep detail in a minute. And it's about leaders finding not just the immediate problems, but the underlying causes of those, medium pro of those immediate problems. And then being able to very clearly define the gap that needs to be closed and the improvement direction that needs to be followed. And that needs to be articulated in a way that everyone in the organization can see how they will contribute, how they can contribute to making this improvement direction happen. And construct the right experiments, carry out PDCA problems, classic problem solving. This is problem finding which is the step before problem solving. We know how important problem solving is to frame the problems, to frame the experiments, to learn from the experiments, and then gradually over time to form lasting solutions that tackle the root causes. This is actually the path of the sensei. All of those leaders found they needed a sensei, somebody who'd seen it before, either as a CEO or as a very deep experienced lean, lean practitioner, who could lead their thought process, because this is an individual process of learning for leaders just as much as it is, is for the teams and the rest of the organization. And the sensei is basically helping the leaders learn this different way of thinking. That, as I said, the military call learning from the ground up leading from the ground up. So this is a very different way of thinking. Instead of the Big Bang, we need a solution, a new solution, go away and design it and implement it, which we will continue to do. Don't, don't get me wrong. But this is a different think thought process, which is let us look at what we've got now. Let us engage people in improving that. And by doing that, we will see the improvement directions that we need to follow in the future. And we can build the capabilities throughout the organization to make those changes happen and fight the silo-based bureaucracies. Let's take those one at a time. 
So finding the right problems. You can only find these problems by going to the front line, going to the design office, going to the customer interface, going to the production site, going to the warehouse, going to distribution. It's only at the front line that you see these pro the real problems that prevent people implementing the systems that you've imposed, that you commissioned, and they are broken, that don't always work because multiple complex systems have a probability of failure. And there will always be interruptions, and people will be dealing with those. How can you learn from the way people deal with those interruptions? And by doing that, you're showing a, commi a commitment to learning, not only your learning, but also their learning. But the real, real value of leaders going and helping and supporting the front line in learning is that leader begins to see, actually, the underlying problems that often have been the result of their decisions that they need to address to remove these as obstacles in the future. So leaders learn by helping others learn. And leaders learn to see the underlying problems and then see the capabilities that are necessary to solve those problems. And maybe challenging some of their previous management practices in doing so. So finding the right problems is fundamental starting point. And setting improvement directions, rather than setting targets, let us set improvement directions at so-and-so, a 50% reduction in defects per year, a 50% reduction in lead time, et cetera, et cetera. What is the rate of change that we want to set? And communicate that in a way that everyone can see how they can contribute to it. And then translate those into physical changes, into the product design, into the process design, into the customer interaction that will deliver system-wide results being very clear what the business case is for those actions. Improved quality, faster time to market and innovation is the core of growing sales. Reducing the total lead time and the increasing the flow from the time you, from order to cash, saves cash. What are you gonna do with that cash? Repeat Kaizen reduces the cost base of your existing production, and it frees up space for new products, for this growing complexity of products that uh, we've heard about earlier. So it frees up capital, saves capital, by using our existing resources. So clear business directions, clear business consequences. And now we see, when we get to the third stage, how do we design the experiments to be done to make those physical changes happen? This is what the Toyota production system is all about. It's not a production system, it's a learning system. It's a way of framing learning in an organization. And most of us have forgotten the, Toyota, the TPS house, the Toyota production system house. In a nutshell, on the right-hand side, the judoka pillar is all about deepening individual, technical, and organizational capability for doing the work. Making it visual, tracking quality at source, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the left side, you have the ability then to create a rhythm, to flow things, at the rate pulled by the customer and so on. That's the collaborative skills that are necessary. You can't have one without the other, and neither of them makes sense without changing, visibly changing the offer to the customer. And the foundation on which that is built is stable teams, is employees capturing their knowledge, their improvements in standards, 
and building using those standards as a baseline for improvements, for proper scientific improvements, classic PDCA problem solving as we're used to. And the underpinning of that is confidence between management and the teams to support them, challenge them, but to provide all the resources they need to complete their task every day. There's a tremendous depth to this. It is the core of this learning process. I urge you to study it again. Because this is what helps to frame the learning for every single action we take, not just to solve that problem, but to think, to learn how to think to solve the next problem and the next problem and the next problem. So very interesting. TPS is a learning system, and it always has been, and we've thought about it as a bunch of tools. And we realize, too, that experiment after experiment sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. We learn from those experiments. And gradually, through repeated experiments, we capture reusable knowledge, knowledge that works, in standards. And capability building is learning to solve tomorrow's problems, not just solving today's problems because you can end up solving today's problems again and again and again. Capability building is each team learning to solve tomorrow's problems, which means it's not about optimizing or rolling out best practice, which is the traditional way we thought about deploying, implementing Lean. It's about building capabilities to solve tomorrow's problem. The sensei is not interested in your solution. The sensei is interested in what did you learn from going through that problem-solving process. That should tell us something. So those, this is a very different way of thinking about leadership, a way of thinking about learning, and a way of thinking about building knowledge through learning that translates into business results. So, two slides to summarize. It's about recognizing that processes, increasingly complex processes, increasingly automated, fine by me, absolutely fine, are going to be a set of activities, each with their own probability of failure. But the more integrated they are, the more the consequences of those failures will be felt across the system. Those integrated systems are always going to reply, rely on human decision-making and judgment to cope with, cope with situations that were not expected to occur. So instead of designing people-free processes, we need to design processes where judgment can balance the, the freeing up of resources through automation. So people-centric processes, bear that in mind. And bear in mind this challenges, fundamentally changes the role of frontline and, and, lean and line management. Because it's line management's task no longer to police people doing the work that was designed by others, line management is there to build capabilities through daily practice of and learning by doing. And leader's role, and this is not easy for a society that respects knowledge and authority as much as you do in Germany, it's about leading by asking questions rather than telling people what to do. Telling people what to do takes away their responsibility for learning and thinking about and proposing solutions to a problem. So it's a very different Socratic way of, of thinking and leading. And this respect for people, which is an absolute heart of Toyota's approach, is on the one hand about challenging them to, to do more, to achieve more, to learn more, and it's also about supporting them in doing that. And finally, as I 
said at the beginning, the true benefit, uh, business benefit of lean is continuous innovation. We are now in a situation where in every industry we're moving away from big bang projects, occasionally launching a project, a new product or a new service. We're now much more in this scale-up phase where we learn to improve day by day our products and services. Learn from the digital world. They are constantly releasing updates every day. Not every six months as we used to for big SAP systems. They're doing it every day, improving modules all the time. So this continuous experimentation and feedback from users is the world we live in now and the world we will live in in the future. Building those communication links with, those, with users is going to be fundamental to building continuous inno innovation. So that's the loop with the customer. As we go back through the organization, we have been very poor accumulating the experience from the continuous improvement, both in our production operations and design operations, but in our supply base, and translating those into the next generation product. So how do we accumulate the Kaizen experience, add it to the technical experience of those seeking new technology? How do we feed that into the next generation products? Phenomenal potential that we are missing. And how do we do this on a continually faster tack time? So the tack time of releasing, as I've already said in digital technology, has gone from the, the yearly release, daily release, uh, to daily release. What is the tack time for releasing new improvements to your products and services? I think it will ultimately be daily but it's certainly not every few years. And two elements to making this work are absolutely critical. One is the judgment for each iteration, what needs to change and what stays the same. Otherwise, engineers want to redesign everything every time. Of course they do. But the real judgment is what is the necessary change for this next iteration that we're going to experiment with and get the feedback from, and what do we not change? So it's the judgment about, and it's a personal judgment built out of years of experience, and it has to be embodied in a person, in Toyota case, the chief engineer, who makes that judgment as to what goes forward into the next generation product, supported by a parallel evolution of the technical capabilities on which he, he or she can draw. Supported by, rather than dominated by. So the voice of the customer, voice of the product, voice of the service is now strongly represented and driving continuous improvement and technology is absolutely, including digital technology, is supporting it. So if we build, if we see this as a system, and we see this as a learning system all the way up and down, and we see it translating, giving that learning back to the customer, then we've begun to understand what the true potential of Lean. So we've tried to capture this different approach to leading and decision making in a book we've just pub literally just published in the United States, and in, it's just in English in Europe. A different approach to decision making, finding the right problems, framing improvement directions, supporting learning, leading from the ground up, as the strategists have taught us. That's the subject of our latest book. And I don't think this is the end of the lean story. I think it is another big piece that was missing. I think other people from the next generation in the digital generation are going to add a lot more to the lean story for the future. So lean thinking evolves. 
but it has deep roots going way back as an alternative way of making decisions and leading organizations. So that's my contribution. I hope that thinking leads you to a different way of doing. Best of luck. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Lean Startup was inspired by, by Lean, by an understanding of Lean applied to how do you get going in this startup business. The issue that the startup doesn't, of course, address is how do you scale up. And what I'm talking about is largely the scale up capability. And what is, what is really unique about Toyota's ability to innovate is not only do they develop the hybrid car and develop the hydrogen car and so on, but they are able to iterate and scale that knowledge and reduce the costs very quickly, much faster than other industries. So the startup and the scale-up actually go hand in hand. So startup just just describes a piece of the, pr of the process of how to break thinking, how to try new things, how to begin that experimentation with users, but doesn't address the issues that we have more experience with of how do we build continuous learning to rapidly scale up what works out of those experiments. So that actually they fit hand to hand. Another question? You. But you never stop experimenting with customers. So the startup mentality never goes away. But it just describes a piece of the story. Sorry, go on. Here's I, I have visited many, uh, many uh, a number of, uh, of middle, middle standard organizations led by the third generation not the generation that had the technical inspiration that led to the founding of the company to start with, but often a generation that is hiring managers from elsewhere to manage the business for them. And so while you're right, there is an intuitive connection between the technical inspiration from the leaders and the close working together with their technical teams and their production teams, the danger is, as middle stand organizations grow, they lose that focus, and they start adopting traditional management, thinking that that's the way they can, they can grow. So in a sense, it's a warning. But it's also, in the other sense, making clear the people side of the success of those middle stand enterprises, not just the technology. Because sure, the technology is what defined them, but actually what made them work in the early stages was a, a very good personal connection between the founder and the, and the people who work for them. They created an organization where people really felt engaged and felt identified with the product. The danger is that gets lost when you hire professional managers. I've seen this time and time again, and it's very sad. I was in one middle stand organization a year ago at their prize giving day for lean projects. They had lots and lots of great lean projects all over the place. And the issue for them was the senior management that they had hired two or three years away from retirement, didn't really want to change things too much, just wanted their pension. They were not interested in really connecting these projects together. So they had the knowledge and you could put your arms around this company. And it was a good company, there's no question that technology is still good. But you could see it was just about to turn off all of that enthusiasm that they generated in all those projects because they were not building them, they were not connecting them, they were seen as just because they've got everybody's doing lean, so they needed to do lean too. And it was just so sad. So I was fairly blunt and uh, Afterwards, the owner, who is no longer involved in the company but is uh, on the board, um, thanked me for being so frank. So that's the problem. All I could do was uncover the problem, not provide the solution. But you're right. This is, in a sense, it's going back to basics. 
but in a, in a ma- much more clear cognitive way rather than intuitive, instinctive way, which was how the middle stance was so strong. So that's why it's very important that not only the big companies, the Daimler and the Airis, Airbus and so on, think about this, and they certainly need to, but that's so wh- why it's so important, particularly in this country, for the middle stand to, to think this through too. Because actually, it's, ha- it's easier to repair in a middle stand company. But they're used to dominating the technology in their marketplace and you know, preparing a next product for the next exhibition in, in a year's time whereas the technology is moving on and they're going to have to go much faster. So, yeah, it's a very good question and uh, very important, and Lean has an important answer to those questions. That you can sign them? Okay. So if you want to buy them, they...